All right, everybody. Welcome. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Wherever you're watching this, you could be live. It could be on demand. Hi, how you doing? My name's Ollie. I'm here to present the show and I'm with two really clever gentlemen who are going to help me help you and help us understand the future and the present of SMS, email, and phone outreach. And they're kind of looking around there. They're looking for these clever gentlemen. So without any further ado, I mentioned Dan. Dan Sims, welcome to the stage, dude. How you doing? Thank you, Ollie. Doing great. How are you? Good stuff. Glad to have you on. Um, Give us a five-second background, who you are, and how you made it to the stage, Dan. Oh, man. Uh, Yeah. I mean, this is the pinnacle of my career. So really, I I started with a vision of appearing on this webinar and kind of worked backwards from there. Uh, So I'm the director of customer success here at VanillaSoft. Uh, I've been at VanillaSoft since I had hair, uh, so for quite a long time. Um, And yeah, we've had to navigate a lot of choppy waters with uh, SMS and voice and and email lately. And uh, I've been talking to a lot of clients about it and figured, hey, what if I could speak to a bunch of people at once and bless you for uh, for giving me this opportunity? Well, yeah, you kind of alluded to it, but there's been a lot of change and um, a lot of people don't know what to do. It's a, it's a weird landscape and Dan and Sean have been the sort of figureheads in our team who have been looking out for that information. Where can we find what is actually current and what do we need to do? What do we need to not do and change and all of those things? So, Sean, welcome to the show, dude. How are you doing? Thanks for having me, Ollie. I uh, I look forward to talking with you two gentlemen today. I'm going to grill you very heavily on email. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> so, guys, um, let's go to phone first. Um, I know Dan's got plenty to say about this. What is the state of play with cold calling, with reaching out, with uh, prospecting? How, whatever word did you want to use because it kind of varies across industry, but using a phone to reach out to your potential customer. What's the state yeah. of play and is there anything particularly coming up on the horizon? So, yeah, uh, there is some stuff coming up. Uh, it, it's probably going to help to give a little bit of background on how we got here. And overall, I'll, I'll, spoiler alert, the phone channel is looking good. Whether it's cold calling, even calling customers or people you have established business relationships with, uh, that's been a lot more difficult the last couple of years. And that's going to start getting easier. So if we look at the phone channel as a whole, uh, it's it's really been going downhill, right? And some of that's the rise of SMS and other messaging applications. Um, obviously, with the pandemic, people tended to go on Zoom as opposed to on like conference calls on a phone. But even even sort of prior to that, the, the biggest thing that's harmed the phone channel is the robocalling epidemic, I'll call it. Uh, we've all had those robocalls, spam calls, scam calls, people trying to scam you out of money saying, oh, I'm with the IRS and you're behind on payments. Or uh, I know for a long time, people were getting car warranty uh, calls. I did as well from US companies. I live in Canada uh, and don't own a car. so uh, But I'd still get the calls. So because of that, the phone channel got very noisy um, with something like 19 out of every 20 calls being a robocall. Uh, and that turned people off of the phone channel. So people stopped answering the phone. If I get called 15 times a day, but only one of those calls is legitimate, the other 14 are not, I'm probably not rolling the dice to answer all 15. I'm probably going to rather just not answer. Uh, and that's kind of what we saw happen. So there's been a lack of trust on the phone side for a number of years now because of this. One thing that made robo-dialing so harmful um, in a lot of different ways, but one of the things that made it spread so much and made it harmful for businesses as well as consumers is the ability to spoof a phone number. <clears throat> so what that means is that any phone company, any VoIP company, any carrier, so we can do this, any any company out there, Twilio, Vonage, anything can do this. Uh, it's really easy to enter a new number for your caller ID, right? And that just changes the number that's broadcast when you make a call. Uh, And you got to think this is the same technology, by the way, like phone technology hasn't really evolved a lot since Alexander Graham Bell. It's all, you know, it all has to still be able to be supported through copper wires and landlines have still been a thing. They're on their way out, but they're still around. And so what can be broadcast through the phone channel is really just a number and sometimes a name and that's it. So the problem with that, though, is that's all you can broadcast. There's no way to kind of verify anything or check it. So picture, you know, person A calls person B, and that's going through carriers. Well, person B's carrier, let's pretend it's AT&T or, or whatever. All they see is, here's a number, here's a name. That's all that's being broadcast. They don't know, well, 
is this actually the phone number that's calling me or is this just the caller ID that's being broadcast? They can't tell that. There is no way to know it because, again, it's copper wire, right? There's no special anything. There's no way to like do a reverse trace back and find out the origin source. You just see what's ultimately delivered. So what that meant is that these robocallers could spoof any number for free, and they would. And then they could call from that number. So I will make my number 555-1234, and I'm going to broadcast and blast out a ton of calls. And as soon as my connect rate dips down, or I've done that for however many cycles, I go from 555-1234 to 1235, right? And I can just keep spinning through and cycling through as many numbers as I want. I'm not spending anything. The carriers can't tell the difference. And there we go. I mentioned it hurts businesses and not just consumers because that number they're spoofing could be your number. Uh, and we've actually had this with a number of clients, like, you know, well-heeled universities that have used the same number for decades. Well, that number ended up getting spoofed by a bad actor. And because that bad actor spoofed the number and the carriers can't tell, the carrier's only real lever is to say, hey, if we see this number calling in, let's tag it as spam or scam likely or something else, or, or maybe in extreme cases, block the call entirely. And that started happening to this university, even though they weren't making calls from this number. Uh, so that's really been the what's hurt the phone channel and the voice channel. But the good news is uh, there is a new framework. Uh, Ollie mentioned it earlier with tokens. It's called Stir Shaken. Uh, it's not a James Bond quote, I promise, but that is basically a framework that the FCC, in conjunction with a bunch of telcos and you know data firms and uh, big big companies, they made this framework where now um, every company in the U.S. that's that's using a phone will need to register or is already registered with the FCC. And they have to be in good standing. They have to get vetted by the FCC. They have to submit all their business info. So effectively, the FCC now knows every carrier um, and each carrier has their own unique token, right? So uh, every carrier is registered. And then now what happens is caller A makes a call to person B, right? So A to B goes through this carrier. But at the same time, there's an API call now being made up in the cloud to the FCC, and that's never happened before. So again, the, the core phone technology hasn't evolved. Copper wires are still copper wires, but there's a secondary call now being made where person A, their carrier, is shooting their token to the FCC's database to say, hey, we are phone company A. Uh, here's our you know in good standing token that shows we're registered, we're vetted, we're authenticated, and we sign for this number. So basically, you can at a test, it's called a, a testing, you can say, hey, this number's ours, it belongs to us, this is our client making the call, no spoofing, we trust the source, you can trust us because we're registered, right? So they broadcast that token to the cloud. On the receiving side, then, person B's carrier also has their own token, they make a call to the FCC saying, hey, we're getting a call from this number, is that legit? And that's where these tokens then can speak to each other, a handshake is happening up in that cloud, where they can say, okay, I see you're in good standing, um, your token is valid, and I see that you are vouching and saying, yes, this is a legitimate call you're receiving. So me, the recipient carrier, I'm not going to tag it as spam or scam likely. It's it's not a, a spammer or a robocaller. I'm not going to block this call because it's in good standing with the FCC. They're registered. They're, everything's hunky-dory. So that is sort of what's coming uh, and, and what has now arrived. It's still not at 100% rollout but it's very near there. So what does that do? Uh, I promise I'm getting to the, to the cool part. So what's that do? Because that by itself doesn't really stop anything. You can still spoof numbers. You can still do this all day. But because that handshake is there, one, soon, once there's 100% adoption, carriers can say, mm, you didn't sign for this. I'm getting a call from a, a, a source that's clearly not registered with the FCC, that's not compliant with Stirshaken. I don't know if I want to let this call go through, or if I let the call go through, I'm darn sure going to make sure it's tagged and that the recipient knows, hey, this is a very suspicious call because they're not registered with the FCC. We don't have that token. That handshake didn't happen. The secondary thing that it does is let's say, okay, because uh, again, spammer scammers, they're pretty smart. They're pretty clever. They have to be. So let's say that you're a bad actor and you do register with the FCC and you have that token and now your calls are going through. Ah, I've cracked the system. I can still, it still works. Well, 
Now, what can happen is there is accountability, right? Because if I start making a bunch of scammy calls from my number that's through a carrier that is registered and whitelisted through the FCC, well, now they can trace that back, right? The FCC knows, hey, carrier A, you're allowing these calls to originate. You're signing for them and saying, no, no, trust us. This is above board. This is our customer. And yet that customer and that number are making these scam calls or robocalling or calling it uncontrolled. Like they're they're doing bad behavior. And then they can levy consequences for that. So you can actually be held accountable now where previously, honestly, you couldn't. A carrier could not penalize someone for robocalling because they all they saw is the number being displayed when they received it. And that number, even if they trace it back and find, oh, this number belongs to Verizon, they don't know that that call originated from Verizon. It could have been spoofed from some other carrier. Now, though, because of this token, because of this handshake, the FCC knows both parties and the FCC can then trace it back. And the coolest thing about this is the FCC has actually started to flex its muscles a bit with this. Uh, we saw earlier this year in January, <laughs> the FCC actually went as far as to issue a cease and desist to Twilio. Um, and this is all public. I'm not putting anyone on blast, but they issued a cease and desist to Twilio because Twilio had one client, which was an auto dialer. And that one client had a client of their own. And that single customer of a customer of Twilio's was engaging in bad behavior. They were spam calling people. People would say, don't call me again. And they would call them again. Because of all that, the FCC went so far as to issue a cease and desist to the parent company, Twilio, right? A fairly large company um, over this case of spam. And what ended up happening is Twilio then identified its customer and said, hey, this is coming from you. Twilio actually shut that platform off for, I think, like 48 hours until that platform then in turn shut down that one customer that was the bad actor that was doing this bad behavior. Um, that's the first time we've seen that where the FCC's really clamped down and has actually taken that bold step. And they were ready to tell all the other carriers, hey, stop accepting traffic from Twilio if Twilio didn't ultimately comply. That sent a huge message. Uh, and they've done this a few other times now in different cases. But ultimately, that is what's uh, made us very optimistic on the phone and voice channel as we look ahead. It's not necessarily that spam calls go away. Um, it's not even that robocalls will go away. There, there still are robocalls. You can do legal robocalling in very specific cases in a very state by state and region by region. But there are times when, when you can do it. Uh, what we're going to see is a ramp down of this illicit spoofing. We're going to see a ramp down of incorrect spam tagging, which has been a massive problem where innocent businesses get their numbers tagged and, and have their connect rates impacted by the actions of someone else, that should all start to ease down because now we have the accountability. Now they know if your number is being spoofed or not because they know where it's coming from. And they can say, hey, I'm getting a call from this number and this carrier. But when I do a reverse lookup on the number, it's owned by a different carrier. There's a lot more tools now at the disposal of the carriers and at the FCC, honestly, to to make sure that the phone channel is not as noisy and not as filled with spam and scam and, and kind of all these things that have been really plaguing us for the last several years. And you can even kind of feel it in, in a few other ways, like uh, the FCC's really clamped down, for example, I mentioned earlier, those car warranty scams. Huge problem, even as recently as like a year ago, big problem. I'd get tons of calls. Uh, we knew a lot of people who did. I'm not going to say the calls are gone. But the volume is severely reduced now. Uh, and if you're watching this, hopefully this resonates with you that you might think back and go, yeah, there was a time where you're getting you know, eight, nine, 10 calls a day for car warranty. And hopefully now that's slowed down to a trickle if it hasn't stopped. And once again, it's because the FCC is getting more agency. They're getting more tools to have visibility into these actions and then to actually have consequences levied on the correct people, the actual perpetrators of these of these offenses uh and we're already starting to see that have a significant impact on connect rates pickup rates as the noise comes down if suddenly instead of 20 calls a day and only one's legit you're getting two calls a day and one's legit you're going to be more likely to answer so all right there's my ramble there's my rant I, on I, uh, I how we got here a, i have a question dan and this is just from personal experience and speaking to people on the phone is you know me personally when i see the you know, spam likely, et cetera, I typically don't answer. Now, the one thing is, though, I do answer a lot 
of calls only when it does have my area code. So I'm in the 647 area code, it does enter. However, in the first three seconds, if I hear nothing on that phone, when I think right in my head, I'm like, I already know it's a spam call. It's a cold call. Is there anything that can be done on that? Or is there any future in that? Because I know personally, if somebody called me on my 647 and gave me the pitch, I would listen. But when, as soon as I hear that little break, I'm like, okay, I'm just, I'm just on that list and I'm being automated. Yeah. So there's, there's two things and, and it's a good question. So one on the local number matching, um, that will still happen, but what's going to change previously, they would invent a number. And we've all probably had this where you get a call from a number that looks eerily similar to yours and maybe only one or two numbers are different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah those are spoofing, right? Like the person calling doesn't own that number. It doesn't belong to them. They're just spoofing a number yeah. and forcing this call through. So that should get reduced. Now, yeah. Matching area codes, like as long as they own the number, as long as a number belongs to them, yeah, they can they can display that number pretty safely, and it's not hard to match area codes or do location based um, presenting. So you still may have cases, and likely will for for a while yet, of local numbers showing up when you get a call, even if it may not be a local company. Um, the second piece of your your question, though, on that delay, yeah, that's. Predictive dialing, robo dialing, yeah. whatever you want to call it, that's a hallmark. Is you answer the phone, you say hello, and there's a slight delay, yeah. and usually there's some sort of audio cue. It used to be like you'd, you'd hear like a little click, but sometimes it's like you suddenly go from no background noise to oh, there's background noise, right? It's like someone coming off of mute, a almost. cold call center, and then you just hear the answer of the phone. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah. uh, as far as will that go away? That practice, as long as it follows all the guidelines will still be allowed. Okay. The silver lining, though, is that that practice of predictive dialing, robo-dialing, shotgun dialing, it's sometimes called, where I'm calling 10 numbers at once, and then if someone answers, I route it to an available agent. That's how these work. Uh, that is getting more and more regulated. It falls under almost like every definition of auto-dialing. It falls under the definition of that. The TCPA, um, which is the uh, you know the act passed by the, the FCC and the FTC, that, that kind of controls and throttles what you can do, where you can do it. There's also state-by-state -state laws around that. So this is where DNC laws come into effect in a lot bigger way. Um, so that, that practice in general is fairly regulated. It's still legal. It's still possible under certain circumstances. If you want to explore it as a, as a business, I would highly advise speaking to a telecommunications lawyer um, because the fines for violating these things are steep. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that the, the frequency will indirectly reduce just because these bad actors are going to yeah. have less and less opportunity. But we're still going to get those kind of telemarkety feeling calls, uh, and <laughs> yeah, that that likely will still persist. All right. So, question for Sean then. So, hearing all that sounds like um, everything's going to sort of rising tide lifts all boats is the kind of feeling I get about this. There's going to be regulation to stop and then to catch, even though if they do slip through the bad actors. What does that mean for you as as a sales leader? We have a sales team. We are very capable of making cold calls. Does that mean in your mind now, some point down the line? significant change, small change? Are we going to be making a lot of calls or maybe start to do some more? What, what are you feeling or thinking? So, I mean, I personally think, I, I think cold calling is, A, it's, it's, it's never going away. I just think it's, 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 it's been around for so long. And I think people for the last 20 years have been the cold calls dead, cold calls dead, cold calls dead. It's not dead. I mean, you know, I, I would say if anything, it's, it's more people are using it now than ever before to be honest. Um, so I think it's just going to be different. It'll be interesting to see what the future holds. I think uh, like, will there be a lot more scripted cold call AI scripts kind of thing? Will there be more, will it be more personalized? Will it be machines doing it? I don't know exactly using your voice. I think there's a lot of stuff that's going to be happening in the future, but I do not think that all the stuff that Dan mentioned is going to – I think, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm pro calling. So I, I don't think there's going to be much – difference um with the sales team using the cold call as a channel um but i th i just think there's going to be changes in the way that they use the channel um and just like you have to adapt to and, you know and, and how email changed how sms changed how social media became a thing linkedin prospecting social selling everything became a thing you just have to adapt to what the changes will be on the phone 
But I don't think that it's going to make a significant change on any sales team. I think they're still going to have to make those dials, and uh, and you know, it's just part of it's just part of the funnel. All right, fair enough. I'll, I'm going to have to move us on real quick because we have two more channels, and I know the next one Dan's going to go crazy for this one. But I would imagine, you know, uh, by incremental gains, the connect rate is the thing that you'd hope to see increasing. If there's going to be less bad callers, there's going to be more reason to pick up the phone, and then that means connect rates. All right, Dan. I'm gonna I'm gonna t- try and time band you here for because I've got a few big things I want to have you hit on here for SMS. So uh, maybe g- give me the two minutes on what is the state of play at the moment, and I don't even mean the new regulations. I mean what are we looking at maybe yesterday, and then we'll get into the the juicy stuff. Yeah. So I mean, look, uh, SMS. Um, the short version is for the last several years. It's really been the Wild West, right? And if you're old enough uh, to, to remember back when, you know, before the Can Spam Act with email, when it was sort of new, I, I kind of liken it to that, where it was not regulated. There weren't a lot of rules or throughputs or, or really any meaningful regulations on it. And so people were kind of free to do as they please. Um, those days are over uh, and there are regulations being pushed um, now to businesses and uh that's taken the form of this 10 dlc registration um 10 dlc stands for 10 digit long code which is like a normal phone number um where basically and you all are probably familiar with short code sms you've received them right text one two three four five to get 20 percent off or you get the, the big blast from whatever your your mobile carrier your bank uh those short codes are in short supply and fairly expensive so a lot of businesses like to use their their actual phone number, their cell phone number, their VoIP number, whatever. 10 DLC is aiming to basically make that regulated in a very similar way to how short codes are regulated. Because to get a short code, you have to get vetted, you have to get approved. Like it's there's a there's a whole you can't just say, Yeah, I want one, here's my money. You have to like get get special approval for it. That is where we are heading with uh with SMS today, uh for anything other than peer-to-peer device to device right so your your cell phone that you just manually text from that isn't inherently going to change but any software application third-party service anything you do to send text messages at any sort of scale they call it a to p messaging right if this is p2p peer-to-peer device to device a to p is application to peer right so it doesn't matter if it's a, a big platform like a vanilla soft or even you know, you just have a virtual phone number through whatever, Google Voice or anything, this regulation's coming. Um, and unlike with voice, it's coming from a band of carriers kind of deciding on the rules and sometimes unifying, most of the times not, rather than this is this is not an FCC. This is not a government regulated restriction. Um, the carriers are kind of voluntarily doing this, presumably to avoid uh, legislation, but yeah, I've got a lot of thoughts on on how that rollout is uh, is going so far. I, I just have a question for actually both of you over here on that topic. Have you guys actually ever replied to a cold text or somebody selling you over text or anything over text? Because me personally, I'll answer the calls sometimes for an actual cold call to listen to their pitch. But I, whenever I see a text come in, me personally, I think this is a virus. This is something I'm not clicking anywhere. I agree totally. And you know what? It's... Even when I receive, like Dan mentioned, you might get uh, an e-commerce text or the bank or something like that, which you expect. So if it's not that and it's not obviously the company's name who I know and trust and I've dealt with them and I know they have my phone number, there's I even distrust that, even if it yes. looks fairly normal. I even believe like I've been charged by replying to these things before yeah. and that's how they've got you. Like I even distrust that. And I, I, I would imagine, Dan, the look on your face as you've been scanned a couple of times by <laughs> replying to your men's health subscription or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hair club for men. Uh, I will, I will say that, um, the, my, my big, I, I don't reply anymore either. I one time got a text from a number neighbor. I don't know if you guys remember that challenge where it's like you add a digit or subtract a digit, right? If your number ends in seven, you text someone who ends in eight and ends in six and say, hey, we're number neighbors. I replied to a text from that and it turned out to be a scam. Uh, yeah. Of course. I was like, oh, cool. I saw this on the TikToks. Uh, and then, yeah, of, of course, it, it, it was yet another scam. They they yeah. tried to get info and so I, I blocked the number. But yeah, 
the engagement I don't, I don't reply to texts of my wife, so why would I reply to a text of a random person <laughs> that texts me? Come on. Okay, come on, uh, guys. This webinar is all right, recorded, right? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, oh, if you want Sean, listening. you hit WhatsApp. WhatsApp is Sean's way to get him. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, so Dan, like, you, you alluded to it very quickly that this is not government-led, which was the bit when, um, when we talked about this first. That was the real head-scratcher to me personally. We know, and we'll get to email in a minute, maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes time. There's GDPR, there's can spam. It's fairly straightforward. If you break a law, it's a law and that's it. But this this seems very confusing. And I, I know that this is going to change a lot. We, we've talked about that quite a bit. So there may well be a follow-up to this webinar. There may be several iterations of it as we go and as this progresses. But what is the deal with the rules, shall I call them, being different? And, and how does that sort of impact me as a person trying to navigate them properly? Uh, well, it impacts you tremendously. So, I mean, the and look, we're confused why the FCC isn't stepping in, why why there's no government body trying to regulate it. And, you know, I know the perception is often, you know, you don't you don't want to get government involved in this. I will say the stir, shake and roll out, even though it's taken years to implement and it's still not 100 percent, it is doing exactly what they said from the start. It would like it's actually is actually being effective and, and doing what they were promising. Whereas with this 10 DLC rollout, it has shifted a number of times. It's been delayed uh, also a number of times. So my best guess as to why is they saw the writing on the wall. And so like other industries, they're attempting to self-regulate to prevent then government regulation. Uh, and they're hoping this will, will take effect. What's happened though is, yeah, you've got Obviously, there's three major carriers in the U.S., um, Verizon, AT&T, and uh, T-Mobile. And initially, only AT&T and T-Mobile banded together to make this, it's called the campaign registry. You can go Google it, TCR, to make this centralized registration body to handle A to P traffic under this new 10 DLC regulation. Tons of acronyms, I know. Um, and so Verizon wasn't even involved until... I think sometime late last year, they were not part of this coalition. Um, and so they initially the pitch was this, hey, look, SMS is the Wild West. Texts were, were starting to get blocked, but you didn't know why, right? They would block it if they thought it was spammy or, or people didn't like it, but you didn't know what rules to follow because there weren't really any rules, right? So the, the initial pitch was, look, we're going to regulate it. We're going to spell the rules out. This is going to allow you higher throughput, more volume, more success rate, better deliverability, all good things. You just have to go through some red tape, pay a fee. Um, but those who do now, now we know you. Now you're in this. Uh, you know, you know what rules to play by. It sounded great. That's exactly what we want. Happen with email, and email marketing is still a pretty good channel. Um, that ended up not being what was delivered. Uh, and part of it is evidenced, even if you go and you do any research on 10 DLC, even though it's a single registration and it's a binary, you're registered or you're not. Each carrier within that has different rules. So Verizon's now kind of clomped on, but T-Mobile and AT&T even, and Verizon, each have different rules and parameters and throughputs and restrictions, even though it's one registration body and you have to check all three boxes to be allowed. So for ex uh, like some simple examples are AT&T will cap how many texts you can send per minute. I think the lowest is, is still fairly generous. It's something like 70 five texts per minute that you can send and now that's across your whole campaign so you could have 500 agents under you and you know the total amount across all 500 is 75 per minute t-mobile on the other hand puts a daily cap they don't have a per minute thing they'll say all right you can have 2,000 texts per day at the lowest level 10,000 at the next and then if you pay for vetting uh which you do have to pay for out of pocket uh they'll let you send up to 200,000 per day but that means you can hit a limit for one carrier and not hit a limit for another. They also have different consequences on if you violate anything. So AT&T's big consequence, if you are found to be spamming or violating their rules, is your messages start getting blocked and your numbers then start getting blocked. And then and eventually your entire campaign gets blocked. So anyone from your number, from this campaign umbrella that all your numbers are underneath, any text to AT&T starts getting rejected, starts getting blocked. T-Mobile, on the other hand, threatens fines. And they say, hey, if you do this, it's going to be a one-time, like if you start sending texts before you're registered, I think it's like a one-time $10,000 fine. Um, and then if you are sending texts, it's up to $500 per text of a fine. 
that they levy on you. And the way they levy it on you is T-Mobile, like let's say my carrier, let's say I'm Twilio, right? I'm with Twilio. T-Mobile gives a fine to Twilio. Twilio gives a fine to their client. That carrier gives the fine to me. Like it's a it's a pass through of fines. Someone's got to pay it. Like at the end of the day, Twilio's got to pay T-Mobile if they want to keep sending texts through T-Mobile's network. So they will. And then it's down and down the list to collect on those fines. Um, there's also other weird kind of arbitrary limits. Oh, and, and Verizon, by the way, doesn't seem to have any limit, but they will just spam filter more aggressively than the other two, it seems. Um, on top of that, if you get to 49 numbers, right? So you, you make this campaign, you register your SMS numbers under the campaign. And again, there's backend stuff that makes sure that both the, the sending receiving carrier, they know where it's coming from. They know you're in good standing. They know this, you know, what this number is being used for, what sort of text you should expect from it. You know, they cover use cases, sample messaging. They make sure you have opt out compliance, all this stuff. So um, again, when you read it, it sounds good. Um, but then for as you grow, when you get to 49 numbers that are registered under the campaign, T-Mobile, and they're the only carrier to get to 50 you have to do you have to submit what's called a number pool request and that's where you have to submit at least 50 numbers so you can't do it when you only have 49 or 45 you have to wait till you have too many then you can submit all the numbers to T-Mobile um, T-Mobile to review it will charge you then $2000 to do this manual review um, it can take anywhere from 2 weeks to we've had some take 3 months uh, to complete and at the end of it if they allow you through, then you can add your 50th, 51st, 52nd number. AT&T doesn't have that restriction. Verizon doesn't have that restriction. You're not doing this for any other carriers. It's only for T-Mobile, but it blocks your entire campaign until T-Mobile will move on this. Um, so things like that are, are what we're seeing where <clears throat> there's no consistency, even though it's it's positioned as this one central registry. There's no consistency on the rules, on the throughputs, on the volume. Uh, it's sort of all over the place. And then on top of that, the whole registration system pivots quite a bit. The charges have gone all over the place. To at first, it was um, like a hundred dollars, then it was free, then it's back to fifty dollars to register, and that fifty dollars is just for T-Mobile. Then there's a four dollar registration for everyone else. Um, there's a monthly fee to maintain it. Uh, there's there's all these other additional rules that kind of get wedged in and then even when they set up the rules they'll then change it so for example you used to be able to very easily register as a sole proprietor right like i don't have a, a corporation i'm just an individual agent but i want to be compliant so i'm going to register well you still can but then they changed the rules this year to where if you do that the carrier your carrier so you know let's say you did it through through twilio twilio then has to send a report every month to t-mobile to Verizon, to AT&T, to US Cellular. They're, they have a small market share, but they're out there. To every carrier, they have to send a report every month with a daily breakdown of how many texts that each sole proprietor sent to each network. And for a sole, like most companies that we've seen have just stopped supporting sole proprietors because it's, it's not feasible to do that amount of lift for one person. So they're in a lot of ways sort of pushing people out of sending SMS um, because it's very prohibitive to do. And then even once you do it and once you feel, hey, okay, I'm, I'm compliant, I'm doing this right, the rules will change month to month. Um, there's no stability. There's no, it's not like stir shaken where they said four years ago, here's what we're doing. And then four years later, that's what they've done. This is, here's what we're doing. Now we're going to do this. Now we're going to change it. We're going to do something else. It's like these carriers got a coalition of interns and that's who they kind of gave the responsibility to and the coalition of interns has changed hands a number of times because there's uh the amount of rule pivots and changes and shifts we've seen has been uh kind of staggering uh to be honest wow speaking of interns we're going to come to sean in a minute i'm kidding <laughs> i just that was so close on the table for me i had to yeah. do it i couldn't i'm sorry everyone that, that was no need for that in the in a, in a moment or two um dan because i got to move us on unfortunately yeah. i know we could talk about sms forever so that it's quite confusing and it's a moving puzzle as it were not to put you on the spot here but i gotta try and of course not legally binding so do not come to us and say that something was uh you're you're up to do your own due diligence but with all of that, is there any sort of guidance at all that can keep me relatively compliant, even at a super basic level? Because there's so many different ways you can get that a bit wrong. 
Yeah. And, and I will ramble a teeny bit more. So yes, there is. And the best practices are one to always clearly identify yourself when you send the message. So identify the business or who you are, if you're not a business, um, in that first message, you also want to include reply, stop to unsubscribe. You want to include opt out instructions in that first message. And by the way, text messages, it's like 140, 160 characters. That's already a lot of your real estate that you're using up just disclosing and then, um, you know, providing the opt out instructions. Those two things are kind of key. Um, Another thing that's very important, and this, by the way, it's not legal advice, but it is true. To send SMS in the U.S., you require express prior written consent from your prospect. So you can't cold text um, like you can cold email or cold call. Uh, They have to have explicitly said you have permission to send me SMS messages on this number. They can't even fill out like filling out a form, filling up a demo request form unless it also has that checkbox that says you can do this and they check it, you can't actually legally text that person, even if there is that connection. Um, So you want to make sure the opt-in's there. A shocking statistic. So anyone who gets a text can report it to spam. I think you can, um, there's, there's tools on your phone to do it. You can also, I think forward to seven, seven, one, two, and, and that like counts as a spam complaint. Uh, 10 DLC allows you one complaint per 10,000 sent messages. And if you exceed that threshold, then you get flagged for review and you're likely to get penalized in some fashion. Uh, So that's why a lot of these instructions of disclose who you are, give opt-out instructions, really honestly, the name of the game, it's not that, oh, I've got this perfect message that will prevent me from getting blocked. You need to make sure that who you're texting does not report you to their carrier. As soon as they report you, you've lost the game. So every strategy you're doing is to stop them from reporting you in the first place. The one other thing, then we'll move on, I promise. The one thing I have to share, uh, last piece of advice, is don't be in certain industries because uh, they've started blocking industries. I mentioned car warranty on the phone channel. Car warranty uh, through text is straight up not allowed. So if you're a car warranty company, because this is a legitimate business, unfortunately, there's a lot of bad players in it too, but there's a lot of legitimate players as well. You cannot register to send texts if you're in that line of business. Um, so this goes beyond the usual shaft industries that are not allowed. And it's starting to encroach in others like debt consolidation and credit repair. That's another industry that we've seen get shut down on at least one carrier other things, different types of insurance, mortgage, lending, loans, those things. These industries that tend to have a lot of scammy, spammy, bad players, as well as doesn't matter if there's good players, but if there's enough bad players, the carriers can just decide, yeah, we don't want that. We don't want that content on our network. And they can just shut your whole campaign down or, or block all of your traffic because you're in a certain industry. So that's uh, that's my last piece of advice. So that's the end of the Sean Finder crypto scams. Thank God. <laughs> I'll never receive another <laughs> buy dollar coin right now for half yeah. price. <laughs> All right. But Matt stuff. Damon said to be bold. Good stuff. Thank you, Dan. Uh, loads of knowledge. And as I said, we're, we're going to have to send you guys some follow-up stuff so you can take a read of this. And it's an ever-changing thing. So as it comes, we will send what we find to you. And, uh, and there'll be another version of this for sure. Really good point. And just to disclose that even further, by the time you watch this, some of these rules may have shifted. Maybe some industries are clamped down. It's it's evolving week to week. And that's to say, Dan has been incorrect. So there you go. <laughs> Only kidding. All right. So Sean, email. This is kind of your uh, your time to shine, dude. So what's the state of play? Um, we, we know that there's been various rules across different places in the world, like GDPR, CAN spam, and those types of things. But generally speaking, what is the current situation? So there's still the, there's still those rules. There's GDPR, there's CAN spam, there's um, Castle here in Canada. Uh, you know, early on, um, they were slapping people on the wrist. Uh, there was a few of the bigger companies. I think Plenty of Fish Actually, uh, Ollie, I think you have a profile on that. Uh, they, <laughs> <laughs> of course, he's gone there. I mean, they, uh, what about they your actually, profiles? <laughs> they actually got uh, um, uh, a fine um, from from for for uh, can spam. So, I think you know early on it was they weren't going after the smaller guys; they were going after the bigger guys. But I do think it's something that over the years will continue to get more strict. 
Um, but there's only a certain amount that they can do. But I don't think, you know, the GDPR, I mean, I, I know, you know, in my first few years in 2000, even 16, 17, I, I was getting all my prospects like, are you GDPR compliant? Are you this compliant? Are you this compliant? Rarely get those emails now, but we still, as a company, you still have to stay compliant because the last thing you want to do is get one of those fines. Because I remember the fines were like, you know, really when we started, it was like a million dollars for a fine. It was like, well, at that point, you know, that's more than our revenue. So um, you got to be very careful. Now, I do think that the one thing is it's not going to change. It'll continue to get bigger, but I don't think they're going to go after the smaller players, like I mentioned, the bigger players, but they have the compliance teams, the legal teams to figure out exactly how to do that. So that's what I would say on the security front. But I do think the the future holds a lot of new things in the email space, potentially with everything going on, with new technologies being built, et cetera. Yeah, uh, I agree. And and as a European, particularly when GDPR came out, um, I have to echo exactly what you said. The fines that I heard of, the breaches that I heard of, few and far between, they were never even a medium-sized company. They were always a conglomerate, huge company. Yeah, and um, That seems to be the thing in at least the UK. Um, I don't know if it's the whole of Europe, but they make an example of someone massive. They just the numbers example. sound exactly. terrifying. And like there's a, a tax thing going on in the UK and they only pick on the number one premier presenter, Gary Lineker, because he's, everyone knows him. And if he lost the case, everyone else is going to fall in line for fear of the same result. So it's not a free pass to say, don't worry about it if you're not a big shot or a big company. It's you can and you will still get found at some point. But there's not, let's say, this like witch hunting thing going on where everyone's going to get reviewed scrupulously. It's not really like that, but it does not mean go and do whatever you want yeah. because you will if, get found out. If they're going to publish a story and the media is going to publish something, they want to publish something that a brand that people know about. Yeah. Uh, they don't want to, you know, a mom and pop shop across the road. Nobody's really going to care if they get fined for a few hundred bucks, a few thousand bucks. But a bigger company, when you're sending them as an example, that's when people will care. But as I, I, and I agree with you, Ollie. I think it's something that you should be aware of. You should also plan and have it part of your processes. But if you're a smaller company, I wouldn't be too worried about them coming after you. Yeah. So then the main other thing really beyond that is beyond the privacy and doing uh, emailing people in a way that you shouldn't. It's just avoiding spam. To me, the main thing at the moment is how do I get replies and how do I book my meetings from email? But the main blocker to that beyond your content, which is completely your control, is not actually being able to be received. And that's often from several reasons, like the setup that you have as your domain, your email. Maybe you're sending 25 links in an email. Believe it or not, that does actually happen. And that is what gets you registered as spam. So help us understand how can we avoid maybe from setup and then beyond into what we're sending spam box because people say spam as flippantly as it's like a dumpster spam with twenty five thousand emails it's not always that you could write me an email now and it landed my spam so i think people yeah. don't quite get that so there, there's a lot of different ways um you know one thing that comes to mind is spam words um you know there we have a spam analyzer in our software um but you know you can google microsoft they all have a list of hundreds and spam words that if you put those in your emails and you have too many of them you'll automatically be pushed into the promotions or marketing folder and some of the words like the word you know receive millions you know obviously the free and discount people know but there's certain words that you know great is actually a spam word, but good is not a spam word. So there's a lot of words that you might not think are spam words that are actually spam words. So that's one way that you can protect yourself. The second thing I would say is a lot of people, you know, there, there are a ton of automated email platforms. There's tons of them. And a lot of people say, you know what, I'm going to email and just start blasting out thousands of emails a day. Well, that's probably the first way you're going to get blocked and or in spam. Um, so what you want to do is there's, there's certain platforms and, you know, we offer one, I think, uh, as well, we offer one on our website, but we offer one on the platform. It's called a ramp up feature. So you're kind of ramping up your domain. And what that means is Google is going to look at, you know, how many emails does Dan send a month? Okay. Well, in April, Dan sent, you know, an average of 30 emails a day. And now in May, for some reason, he's sending 350 emails per day. Well, they're going to say, hmm, either his account's been hacked or He's using something to automate his messages and spam people. So what do you do? You ramp it up. You try and get that 30-day average. So if you're sending 30 in April, you might want to go to 40 or 50 in May. And then you want to go to 60 or 70 in June. So over the year, over six months, you're really ramping that up. That Google's going to say, oh, well, Dan's sending about 250 to 300 emails a month. 
He's still sending 250 to 300 emails a month. So he's not doing in any you know illegal or slap on the wrist activity. So those would be the two ways. Um, I would say the third way is, you know, a lot of people use third-party softwares. Use third-party softwares where it's A, it's not a personalized email, you're using their servers, there's different reasons there. Um, using uh, your own platform with someone that is linking directly to your email, but really personalizing your outreach is probably the most important. It's so funny how I still get emails that people say hi there and hi uh, hi with the brackets saying first name without actually forgetting to actually input the first name. And I will tell you, when you send 300 high first names, Google and Microsoft, they are going to catch you. So um, those are the things I would be um, that you can control um, uh, at the forefront of sending those emails. Good stuff. Okay, so the, I, the setup, it's the lack of links and those things ramping up. So you're not going from Dan started crypto dot whatever on day one. And by day 15, he's sending me 2000 emails. It's the spam words. Dan, I cut you off. What were you going to add to it, dude? Well, you, uh, yeah, Sean just hit on something that actually applies to the other channels as well. That that concept of ramp up, um, it's it's not as well defined, I would say, as as email, because uh, you know the spam blockers for this are are really a black box, right? It's it's held by the carriers. The carriers ultimately decide. But what we have seen is if you get, for example, a brand new number and suddenly start making 200, 300 calls from that number a day or more, your likelihood of getting spam tagged uh historically or getting getting somehow penalized skyrockets uh and so because we used to and we still sometimes do see the tactic of people saying oh this number's been tagged or has gone bad i'll just swap it out for a new one there's no binary it is spam tagged it's not spam tagged it is this sms number is blocked it's not blocked it's not a true false thing it is dynamic it's fluid they have real-time data aggregators and analytics that are reviewing the traffic from all these sources looking at the historical 30 day 60 day 90 day average and trying to see hey is this normal abnormal if abnormal we take a closer look and we make a decision and then we may decide to block so just throwing it out there for anyone who may need to hear this if you're swapping numbers out for sms or for calling and thinking that that's going to help you and and bypass these spam tags or getting blocked, it's very likely doing more harm than good. Because uh, every time you get a new number, you're starting over from zero, and suddenly you go from zero to a hundred. Uh, that's going to raise red flags, no matter what you're doing. Okay, guys, I'm going to give you a quick question each. Maybe you got a minute each, roughly, and then I got to get us out of here. I'm watching the clock a little bit. Um, so let's start with Sean first to keep him on his toes. Um, your email's got to get ramped up. So sending 30 emails a day, something like that, you can't just go to 200. Let's say you've got the same type of thing going on with your phone and your SMS. You want to hire a new salesperson. That type of thing is very common. And we always hear, I want to hit the ground running and those types of things. But you've got to take into account that ramp time. What what planning can you do to ease that? Because it's just you don't just join and have the ability to do 30 and someone else next is doing 200 and it's the same. It's just not like that. So how can you plan to help them out with that? And that's a great question. It's something that we've actually implemented from day one with all our salespeople is from day one, you start the ramping up. So as soon as they get their email from IT, you start in day one. And typically, if you're new into a sales role, it's going to take you two, four weeks just to do your training, do all your HR documents, learn the processes, learn the techniques, learn the tech. And while that's going on, you're ramping up your email, you're sending out emails. There's different ways to do that. You could be sending internally emails just to, to for your new email address to be sending 30, 40 a day. I could be sending two to you, all. You're replying, you're helping me out. So I would say the most important thing is from day one, as soon as you get that email, to start that day, if it's calling, whatever it is. So when you're actually done your training, because typically even enterprise sales, you know, a lot of companies don't expect you to have sales or results within the first 30 days. We'll use those 30 days to ramp everything up. So on day 31, you're ready to rock and roll. So that would be my, my advice is don't waste any time at the forefront. Be proactive. Start from day one. Start ramping up everything so that you're ready to go once you're done training. All right, Dan, what you got? Yeah, what he said. Uh, just Easy. start start early. Uh, the one the one thing that we've seen also work on like the the phone side is to almost keep a bank of numbers um, that that you use rather than um, registering a net new number for for a new salesperson. Um, like if salesperson A leaves, you might keep that number um, because it's got some history. It's it is established, and you know the the carriers know. Hey, 
we expect some traffic and volume. So even though it dips down for a time, when it ramps back up, it's not as uh, jarring or as confusing. I think it's a little bit easier with with calling an SMS to have more of a gradual ramp probably than email, just because email is so easy to scale. Uh, where calling, you know, as long as you're not robocalling, uh, it's usually one to one, and and it can only go so far so fast. Uh, I mean, the the biggest thing though is getting to a point of consistency and and trying to maintain it, not having big spikes of, I'm going to do no calling, no calling, and then do 500 calls. Um, trying to keep as consistent as possible just so the carriers know what to expect and they're not going to freak out and and, uh, and penalize you. Um, that, would, that would be my advice. All right. Good stuff, gentlemen. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to get us out of here. But before we go, just a quick reminder, you'll get the recording of this. Don't worry, it will come to you roughly tomorrow. And beyond that, we're going to have to do, as I said a couple of times, some follow-ups, whether it just be a refresher of the new rolling or another version of this, maybe in a few months or next year, something like that. There'll be various iterations of this. So plenty of stuff to come. We'll send you what we find and anything external that we find from the carriers, for example, we'll also share that should it come up. So without further ado, guys, um, I'll let you go as my cat comes to say hi. Sean, uh, where can people find you? Ask you a question. Yeah, I mean, mostly on, I would say, LinkedIn. Uh, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So follow me, uh, add me, um, or if you have any questions, you can email me at sean.finder at vanillasoft.com. Just put crypto free discount in your subject line. Sean will definitely reply. Yeah. Dan, what about you? Uh, similar. My email is daniel at vanillasoft.com. So if you have any questions or want to bounce anything off, uh, you can reach out to me directly there. Otherwise, LinkedIn is the main thing. Just look for the big broad white head and uh you'll you'll find me and yeah please send me free crypto that would be great right <laughs> quick group before we go you've got daniel at vanilla soft there's two daniels there's only one ollie i don't have ollie at someone care to explain that what the hell it's it's a matter of gravitas it's we can tenure. we can talk it's about tenure, it <laughs> tenure. Tenure. Okay. Right. oh I don't see. say that <laughs> it just means i'm old there's a three-letter word i was gonna say and uh, i'm going with experience is the, the there variation. we go uh, experience it's okay already. gentlemen well thank you very much good stuff great information and there'll definitely be follow-ups to this but i'll let you go so for anybody watching who made it this far well done congratulations you have a longer attention span than i do Thanks for watching. Let us know what you thought. Any questions that you may have, we'll do our very best to answer. Just reach out either to one of the three of us or all of them. And um, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.